but Linda never came back. Caroline Roberts first met the West six months before Linda moved in. In her statement to the police, Caroline recalled in chilling detail how the West selected their potential victims. This one night I was hitchhiking back from Tewkesbury on my own and this car pulled up um, with two people in and this was Fred and Rose West. When I first got in there, I didn't think they were a couple because of the age difference and the fact that she was quite an attractive young girl and he was not an attractive man. As we went on our way back towards Cinderford, we got talking and they seemed really friendly and that's when I found out they'd just got married and that they had um, three little girls. And they, they were talking to me and asking me about what I was doing and that and I said that... I tried to avoid being at home as much as possible because of my stepdad, we kind of just didn't get on. And with that, they both at the same time just turned around and said, hey, would you like to come and work with us, looking after our children? And within a week of meeting them, I moved in to 25 Cromwell Street. Caroline's job would be to look after Heather, newly born baby May, and Anna Marie, the oldest child from Fred's first failed marriage. One of the strange things was that they had a lot of visitors, mainly men, come into the house. Um, and I used to look after the children while Rose was with these men. And I'm sure she must have told me she was mas a masseur, which I believed at that time. There was an even darker side to Fred. He'd, he'd tell me um, things like he'd performed abortions. Oh, don't worry if you get pregnant, Caroline. You know, we can put you right. I can do abortions. I've done abortions before now. And, he, he, and the sickening thing was that he would say things like, yeah, and the women were so grateful they'd offer their bodies to me straight after. Which, yeah, and I, I thought, nah, this man's just making it all up. He ain't right. Shortly after, Caroline left Cromwell Street, hoping never to return but Fred and Rose had other plans for her. For Paul Britton, Caroline Roberts' statement made one thing clear, the house was the key. To understand the Wests fully and what went on inside their home, he needed to visit the crime scene. He needed to visit Cromwell Street. It was an ordinary house. It was one of a row. It was the end one, as I recall, and I think its neighbour on one side was a church. The church walls made the boundary on one side of the house. Going up the stairs, they're quite steep, but as you turn round on the back of the doorway and the, the bit above the doorway, there is a full-length picture of a woman, very reminiscent of the younger um, Rosemary, beckoning. Disturbing details of the West's lives started to emerge. Bedrooms Rose used for prostitution, fitted with listening and recording devices so that Fred could watch. But most significant of all for Britain was the cellar. This part of the house was quite self-contained. Um, people could go about whatever they did there, being reasonably sure that they weren't going to be disturbed. If you came in through the back way, you'd have to come in through kitchens and a bathroom area, and to get to where we are now is quite an intricate little route. So you're not going to be disturbed. There are no external windows. The brickwork is quite thick. You are in the lower part of the foundation of the house. So that, if you like, is the... Uh, it, it, it serves a joint function. It's the ultimate pleasure room, but it's also the working room. It's, it's the room where these dreadful things are done. He told the police to move their search inside the house. I mean, the words in a way were clumsy, but I mean, they're in the garden because the house is already full. Paul Britton had said that West was a predatory sexual psychopath. Um, and he had said quite clearly that 
there was a possibility of there being more victims. I'm saying now that you are facing something that you have never ever seen before and probably very few of your colleagues have seen and you really don't want to see it. The police began to search the cellar for more victims. Fred was told they had moved inside the house. He was also questioned about Linda Goff and why Rose had been wearing her clothes. Fred refused to answer. Just after half past five that afternoon, uh, I received a phone call from the cell block to say that uh, Howard Ogden, the solicitor who was representing West, had asked to see me urgently. When he arrived, he appeared quite pale, and uh, I remember he asked me if I'd like to sit down. I wish to admit to a further a prox, nine killings. It was something that just seemed to be beyond belief. Nine killings. Completely unexpected, out of the blue. Expressly, Charmaine, Rena. Beyond my personal experience. Linda Goff. And I suspect that of many other police officers. And others to be identified. I even questioned whether, uh, personally, I was capable of handling this. F. Officers in Gloucester searching 25 Cromwell Street have today discovered what they believe to be another set of human remains. Everybody wanted to know what was going on. Christened the Angel of Cromwell Street, Hilary Allison became the voice of the police investigation. But with global press interest growing by the second, Hilary had her hands full. My recollection is, is walking out to give a briefing and suddenly having cameras flashing all over the place, questions being asked of you, microphones thrust in your face. And what we had to try and do was manage that and say, come on, folks, be reasonable. Questions one at a time. We will read a statement out for you. We will do some interviews with you individually afterwards if you want it. But please, can you just back back? I'd come down Cromwell Street and the place looked like, uh, I don't know what it looked like, a football match with uh, Japanese photographers. And at one occasion, the police had had barriers up and they sort of burst through at one occasion. It was almost crushed against the wall. It was a bit off-putting when you're just trying to go to work. <laughs> we had a number of calls from reporters all over the country, national and, and local, saying, well, we've now heard it's going to be 32 bodies, it's going to be 69 bodies. We've heard that Fred West has fathered 32 children. All sorts of um, things were being put to us. Now, of course, all we could say at that stage was, look, this is pure speculation. No one has mentioned those figures. As soon as we get any information, we'll give it to you. Um, but we certainly can't get into the business of speculating. Whatever the press imagined, the police now knew there were 12 victims. Three had been identified, Heather, Shirley Robinson, and now Alison Chambers, who Fred had wrongly claimed was Shirley's maid. I wish to admit... Fred had also confessed to a further nine murders, including his first wife, Rena Costello, and her daughter, Charmaine. But where were Lucy Partington and Linda Goff? Were they buried in the cellar? or hidden in the walls of 25 Cromwell Street. And if they were, how could Fred's wife Rose not know about the murders? Fred West had confessed to the murder of 12 young women, but the horror was not confined to West's home in Cromwell Street. Fred told the police there were other bodies in other places. He led them to Much Markle near Gloucester, the tiny rural village where he grew up. This field's known locally as uh, Letterbox Field. When we brought him out here, hoping that he could identify the location where he buried the body.
We were very fortunate within four days of starting excavations here, we did recover human remains. Um, and those were subsequently identified as being of uh, Rena Costello, Fred's uh, first wife. Now, she hadn't been seen since 1971, so the uh, body had been in the ground for more than 20 years. But there was something else, something detectives hadn't bargained for. Fred revealed that lying close by was another body, Rena's friend, Anne McFall, who, like Shirley Robinson, had also been pregnant with his child. At the time that we believe the body was buried, the field was completely different. There was a, a small pond down there, and more than that, the farmer had told us that he'd added about eight or nine feet of soil above the original level. We spent two months here digging out a huge amount of ground. In fact, the hole was the size of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. We'd done all this work, and we were almost on the point of closing the operation down when we finally discovered the, uh, the, the remains. The recovery of the, uh, the remains of Anne McFall was rather poignant here because we believed that she was probably the first victim of, of Fred West, and she was the last one to be found. Inside West's home at Cromwell Street, the police search was also reaching a conclusion. Inch by inch, they'd stripped the house bare. Five more unknown victims had been painstakingly exhumed from the basement. And in the bathroom, they finally found the remains of Linda Goff. Cromwell Street was empty at last. With nothing left to find and the media demanding information, the next task for the police was to identify the victims. This onerous task lay in one man's hands. Professor Whitaker was making progress with a skull from the cellar with a distinctive clue to its identity. This girl must have had some damage to her two front teeth. They had crowns on them. These crowns were temporary crowns. Now, to a dentist, this means she had an accident, probably. She had the work done to make new crowns. She had temporary ones put on, and she died, and was unable to go back for that fitting. The precision of Whitaker's observations led a police colleague to ask him an unlikely question. She remembered an incident from a hockey match many years before, when a local girl had her teeth knocked out, and she asked, if it could be the same girl. We had, I don't know, 10,000 missing girls in Britain. They were in the frame. And a woman police detective says, do you think it could be this girl who was playing hockey? And of course, the answer has to be, it's incredibly unlikely, but we ought to check it out. The team was put on to sort this out, and it turned out to be her. I realised that Lucy wouldn't be dead if she hadn't been a female and if she hadn't been collided in this most extraordinary and incomprehensible way with the world of the West that was the complete opposite of her life. The girl who'd once played hockey was Lucy Partington. After 20 years of waiting, Marion could lay her sister to rest. She asked the police if she could see Lucy's remains. I just walked forward and took the lid off and there it was and there was something about the shape of it that was just immediately I knew that it was Lucy's skull. <laughs> 